Welcome to Sunday Night Live. I'm Harold Herring, and that's my fine wife, Beth. You may know, uh, you and I remember because we heard him say it, but Brother Kenneth Hagin used to say and talk about some believers, bless their darling hearts and stupid heads. <laughs> Sometimes I'm amazed at what comes out of the mouths of Christians. Mm. Now, I'm talking about people who love God with all their heart, who are in church every time the door is open, people who will no doubt go to heaven. But sometimes they say things that are not smart, don't realize it, spiritually speaking, of course. For instance, I can't tell you how many people as I've traveled said to me, well, I just can't do anything about my situation. It's just the way things are. And, and when I hear that statement, I want to go, don't say that. I want to say, don't say that. And then I say to him, do you realize how spiritually, and I say this with love to you, do you realize how spiritually ignorant and harmful that statement is? In fact, are you listening to yourselves? Do you understand the words that you're sowing into your future? Mm. The words we sow will either bring a harvest of blessing or a crop of negatives. That's it. A crop of negatives <laughs> that we don't want. That's it. Now, when someone says, it's just the way things are. It's a statement of resignation, uh, and resignation always leads to self-pity. And, and it's a tactic the enemy uses to not give hope to people. That's right, to talk you right out of where God wants to take you. And, and I want to tell you, I, to use another one of Brother Hagin's lines, I'm such a positive person that when I take aspirin, they feel better. That's it. But even being that way, I uh, occasionally, uh. rarely, <clears throat> I will say something and I go, who just said that? Or sometimes my wife, she'll look at me like, is that what you want to get in your future? <laughs> you anyway. want to sew that into your future. There you go. But you know, we all make mistakes we that do. way. And we have, but, but it, what it, we're trying to talk about tonight and make, remind people you got to watch what comes out of your mouth. You know, That's right. Sometimes we use a current situation to gain sympathy or express frustration with the yeah. things we're saying. Either way, it's fodder, food, for the demon hordes That's to right. run wild. When you say, That's it. Um, you know, I, like I said, I've heard well-meaning, God-fearing Christians use expressions as, as some sort of self-justification as to why they're not doing better and how things are going. Saying something is just the way it is mm. is a rationalization for limitation and ineffective stewardship. That's right. And that's the bottom line. In fact, there's people I think sometimes, and sometimes, honey, you're right, they, they don't even know they're doing it. That's right. Because of the environment they were born in. Or sometimes just things come, you know, facts. But facts change, but the truth of God does not change. You know, people who want a free pass mm. from effective stewardship, what's that they talk about on well, Scripture? They talk about Psalms 16, verses 5 and 6. Sometimes they use it as a spiritual, you know, excuse for staying where they are. And as it says in Psalm 16 verses 5 and 6. It says, The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. According to the dictionary.com, the 21st century meaning of the word maintain is to keep in existence or continuance, persevere, retain. Literally it means hang on to what you got. But in examining Strong's Concordance, you'll find the Hebrew word for maintainest, H8551, H8551, and it has quite a different meaning. It means to grasp, support, attain, lay hold of, to be held, to be seized. Mm. I think it's clear that to grasp, attain, seize gives a much different impression of the word. That's right. Things evolve over time. Yeah. But let's go a little further. According to Strong's Concordance, the Hebrew word for lot, <clears throat> not the person, but like your lot in life, 
That's it. Is H1486. H1486, and it means lot, portion, recompense, retribution. Now, I've discovered that people tend to focus on the last part of that verse and not the first part. You know, they focus on the part that says, uh, they, they, they don't focus on the first part that says, the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and my cup. If you're maintaining, it's your inheritance from the Lord. And it's most certainly unrestricted. That's right. Because the New Living Translation, a little more modern, of Psalm 16, 5 and 6 says, Lord, you alone are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard all that is mine. The land you have given me is a pleasant land. What a wonderful inheritance. Does that sound like limitation to you, baby? Not not to me. Not in the least. That's it. And the Message Bible translation says, <laughs> my choice is you, I God first Bible. and only. And now I, I find I'm your choice. You set me up with a house and a yard, and then you made me your heir. Wow. And just for the record, your lot in life is not to live in overcrowded housing, in an overhouse, overcrowded housing complex where you got to mm. duck every time a car drives by. That's not God's best for us. No. So I want to look at those words again, honey. I want you to do that scripture again. Psalm 6, 16, 5, and 6 in the Message Bible. The Message Bible. My choice is you, God first and only, and now I find your, I'm your choice. You set me up in a house with a house and a yard, and then you made me your heir. Wow. I love it. Yeah. We could teach <laughs> just that verse. Maybe we'll do that sometime. Here are seven reasons that you're a lot in life is more than you think. That's it. First, you got to make the right choice. You got to make the right choice. Interestingly enough, the word choice appears in the King James Version of the Bible 23 times. In 12 of those verses, the word choice is the Hebrew word H4005, H4005, which means choicest, best. Yes. If having the option of choosing the best in life if that's our option, and the Scripture says it is, then why in the world would we settle for less than the best? That's it. Or what we perceive to be things, uh, well, just... Just the way they are. The way are. they are. That's it. And, and, and the thing of it is, sometimes it's because of background. It's the environment that you grew up in. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, fact that you were never taught the fullness of God's Word. But, but the point is, once you realize it, yep. once you learn the Word, once you see it for what it is, it's time to make that choice for change. Yep. In 1 Corinthians 12, 31 in the Classic Amplified, it says, But earnestly desire and zealously cultivate the greatest and best gifts and graces, the higher gifts and the choices graces. And yet I will show you a still more excellent way one that is better by far and the highest of them all, love. And God is love. We have a book, I think you read, called A More Excellent Way. Yes, that's a yeah. health book, yeah. really, about choosing the Word, because things manifest in your body by the words that come out of your mouth. But once again, here's the question. In hearing that verse, does it sound like that God wants us to settle that's right. for less than the best? Don't I think don't so. think so. I don't think so. Mm -mm. Not only that, he wants us to spend eternity in heaven with him. Hallelujah. This is, this is not totally um, connected to this, number one. But I read this quote and I liked it. So it kind of fits in, but anyhow, <clears throat> I like it. I put it on the outline. Josh McDowell, noted author, said, A lot of people say, well, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? First off, God doesn't send anyone to hell. If we go to hell, it's by our own choice. But when someone says to me, how can a loving God allow anyone to go to hell? I turn around and say, well, how can a holy, just, righteous God allow sin into his presence? That's, That's a, strong a pretty quote. good, yeah, it is a strong quote. Second, you're the only <laughs> one who can make the choice. There you go. 
1 Corinthians 8, verse 9 in the Classic Amplified Bible. Mm -hmm. Only be careful that this power of choice, this permission and liberty to do as you please, which is yours, does not somehow become a hindrance, cause of stumbling to the weak or over-scrupulous, giving them an impulse to sin. That's an amazing quote. That too. This well, power of choice. Preach a week on that one too. We could. You know, this permission and liberty to do as you please. Yeah. We are creatures of free will. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean you sin and then ask forgiveness and sin and then yeah. ask forgiveness and sin nope. and then ask forgiveness. Nope. It's not the way it works. Nope. Amen. God started out giving options of choice a long time ago. Yes, He did. And they appeared to be crystal clear. Even in Deuteronomy 11, verse 28, this in the New Living Translation, it says, Look, today, I like how it says look. That means you better pay attention. Look, today I am giving you the choice between a blessing and a curse. So clearly. The choice was theirs, just as it is ours back then as it is ours today. That's right. But you're exactly right. Look, I, I'm, I fully believe that every single one of the 800,000 words in the Bible was put there for a reason. And we need to find Very out what the reason is. And we need to find out what they are. Yeah. So when he says, look, you know, he, he, wants, you you, need to look. he wants us to get a hold of it. That's it. And he says, today, I'm giving you a choice. That's it. Of course, the choice is ours. Growing up, yeah, our parents made choices for us. That's right. But there comes a point an age of accountability where we become responsible for the choices we make, either good or bad. And you find out, you know, sometimes you find out your parents' choices were not all that great. But then you also know that you have an ability to choose another path. You know, truthfully, they can also be life and death decisions. That's true. You know, when, whether you realize it or not. Mm. It may not be physical death, but it could be death of a spiritual well-being of someone or financial well-being in a relationship. That's right. Deuteronomy 30, verse 11 in the New Living Translation says, The choice of life and death. This command I am giving you today is not too difficult for you to understand, and it is not beyond your reach. You know, there's actually that scripture over in Romans where it says, you know, the Word of God is in your mouth, even in your mouth, you know, to be able to say, and then it talks about, you know, what you confess before the Lord, and that's what, how you get saved. It is what we say and the choices we make. Our choices should all be predicated on our obedience yes. to the Word of God. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 10, New Living Translation, it says, The Lord your God will delight in you, if you obey his voice and keep the commands and the decrees written in this book of instruction. And if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, that is a choice. Obeying the God. And you know, if there's a difference between having blessing and curse and having to do with <laughs> obeying the, you know, you got to be, you Dumb got to, there you go. No offense to people who own cats. Dumber than dirt is what no, they usually say. Works. To not want blessing. And then in Proverbs 2, verse 11, New Living Translation. And by the way, I didn't say the cat was dumb. I said cat hair was dumb, just for the record. Clear that up. I did. I'm just kidding. Proverbs 2, 11, New Living Translation. Wise choices will watch over you. Understanding will keep you safe. Wow. It just pays to read that word every day and be reminded of a few things. Wow. Mm. Dwight L. Moody, renowned pastor and author, teacher, Amen. he once said, one of two things you must do. You must either receive him or reject him. You receive him here, and he'll receive you there. You reject him here, and he'll reject you there. Wow. That's a great quote. That is a down-to-earth quote. Yep, it is. <clears throat> Third. Go ahead. God must always be first. He needs to be first in our lives if we want to succeed. Proverbs 3, 4 through 6, Living Bible. If you want favor with both God and man and a reputation for good judgment and common sense, then trust the Lord completely. Don't ever trust yourself. 
In everything you do, put God first, and he will direct you and crown your efforts with success. Question you have to ask this time of year. Are we putting God first? There you go. And, uh, you know. Do we just say he's the reason for the season? Do we just say, you know, that we're... You know, that he that we want presents or, or we, is, or we want so his presents. Or we're so concerned about buying gifts for our family and friends. To impress other people. Yeah, that or we to don't, bless other people. That we don't oh, that's quotable. help bless those who would be without. There you go. If someone doesn't bless them, be careful. Mm. That's a good scripture. That is a good scripture. Hear, hear, hear this. God will. Scripture doesn't say might, could, or should. Scripture says that's when... You put God first. He will. Mm -hmm. He will direct you and crown your efforts with success. That's it. Psalm 90, verse 17. That's one of those, you do this and he does that. Yeah, verses. if you do this, he will do that. Psalm 90, verse 17 in the New Living Translation. And may the Lord our God show us his approval and make our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. When we put God first not doubting his word or promises. Mm. He will show his approval of our faithfulness by making our efforts, the things we put our hands to do, successful. There you go. Putting God first means not doubting his promises. If, if you're facing what appears to be dire circumstances in the natural, have faith. Put God first. Mm. Putting God first means that regardless of your job status, God will come through for you even when things appear to be hopeless. And you read the story of Joseph for encouragement. In yes, that. I love throwing that in. I know. Putting God first means true. just that. Just that. Honoring Him for who He is, what He's done in and is doing in each of our lives. And just, just recognizing that He is everywhere with you because you and, carry Him with you. And putting God first also means standing your ground. Yeah. against every demonic attack, against you, your family, your finances, your health. Mm. And um, That is true. That's true. Speaking of health, pray for my mama. Yeah. And uh, she's, uh, the enemy's attacking her. <laughs> Not that he can win. Not that he, he picked on the wrong woman. But uh, anyhow, but she, yeah. just keep Miss Andy Ruth in prayer. That's it. Hallelujah. She's going to be good, but... We pray for one another that we may be healed. That's it. Amen. Uh, fourth, never put idols of any kind before God. That's it. Exodus 20, verse 3, the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. If money becomes so important that it messes up your priorities, then it becomes a false god. That's it. Because it can cause a person to ignore not only the true God, Mm -hmm. the family and friends and other things that have real value, true, lasting value. And please notice that I said can. Can cause us to ignore what should be our first love. I didn't say it will cause misplaced priorities, but I said it can. The choice is clearly ours to make based on our personal relationship with our Heavenly Father. We will either seek Him Seek the idols of this world. And when you say idols, some people go, yeah, but Brother Harold, I don't, I don't have one on the dashboard of my car. But maybe that car is an idol for you. You know, well, Brother Harold, I, you know, I, you know, I don't. You see, they, they think in other terms. But an idol can be the new car, the new house, the new couch, the new TV. Anything that you put before mm -hmm. God. That takes you away from that your takes you thoughts away. on God. Uh, that messes up your priorities. Yes. And they need to be straightened out. Personal relationships are sacrificed mm. when people put, well, let me put it another way. Personal relationships are sacrificed when people worship money. I'm not going to say put it first. I say worship money. Mm. It's sad to say that in this country of ours, there are babies aborted every day because of money. We have places, we place our children in the care of strangers because of money and the things it buys. That's it. But that particularly true is about abortion. Mm. It really is.
It is very sad. And not just the money it costs, mm -hmm. but the inconvenience that people oh, yeah. feel. Well, I don't want a child to inconvenience me. I want to go on with my life. So they murder a baby. No other way to say it. Lots of things we could preach on that one. Psalm 115.4 says, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. You know, if something that's the work of, our, of somebody's hands, like, you know, like we talk about, like cars and how things, things, things don't take the place of people, you know, and God is above all. When money becomes an idol, yeah. idol I can tell you this, God is grieved because He knows, He knows the lasting consequences mm -hmm. it can cause to everyone who chooses the wrong set of priorities. Right. And there's a proverb, I read a proverb every day. I can't remember which one it is. But there's a proverb, and I think it's in the New Living Translation, that says, you can rationalize your thoughts to God, but is He convinced? So, you know, you can pretend. Psalm 106, verse 36 says, and they served idols which was, were a snare unto them. You know, there are 119 knows. verses, King James Bible, that deal with idols. And I've read them all, every single one of them. And I can tell you that without equivocation, an idol is anything that replaces your Heavenly Father. And putting an idol, anything before your Heavenly Father, is frankly a death wish. Well, and I think we just have to be circumspect in our lives to not let it seep in without us knowing it. Not just physical death, but spiritual oh, yeah. death. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, I know what you mean. In Revelation 21, verse 8, it says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and, are, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know, that's an interesting list. The, it uh, really the is. The abominable, the murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars. Well, let me tell you this. It says even in John, it talks about um, murder. It says when you talk about somebody, you are murdering them, you know, with your words. So there's just a lot of ramifications in that that makes you want to be circumspect. Very I well. mean, we're not perfect people, but we can repent and get right as long as we're willing to see it. Five, you're the one he chose. That's it. You're the one he chose. I like it. John 15, 16. Ye have not chosen me. Think about this, all you who call the Lord your God. You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Give it you. When the scripture says bring <laughs> forth fruit mm. and that our fruit should remain, doesn't that sound like he just, that to say to accept your lot in life is negative because that's not what he's talking about. That's right. And it's especially true, honey. The last part of that verse that says that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. You know, there are a lot of times as an intercessor, I am standing in the gap standing in the gap for people. And you know, you want to be so obedient before God that you know He's listening and that He will come through for this person or that person, whoever it is that you're standing in the gap for. And that's the kind of power you want to have in your life when you really need it for somebody who is really walking a line between maybe life and death physically or, you know, a spiritual problem that they're having. You want to be able to ask whatsoever you will and let them know the Lord is going to answer that prayer, that kind of relationship with Him. Amen. Amen. And here's the really great news, right? Well, when we're producing fruit for the kingdom of God, the Scripture says that God will give us whatever we ask Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What an offer. <laughs> You'd have to be a hamburger short of a happy meal not to take advantage of that life-changing offer. <laughs> you really, Amen. You really will. Amen. Leviticus 20, verses 22 through 24 in the Contemporary English Version. 
Obey my laws and teachings, or else the land I'm giving you will become sick of you and throw you out. The nations I'm chasing out did these disgusting things, and I hated them for it. So don't follow their example. I am the Lord your God, and I have promised you their land that is rich with milk and honey. I have, cho I have chosen you to be different from other people. Think about that last sentence. That's it. I have chosen you to be different from other people. Does that mean at the office party? Or, you you know, can laugh at all the dirty jokes. You can laugh at all the dirty jokes. Or, you know, I'm, He's chosen us to be different. That's it. To be different. To stand out. To be His. To make a difference. Six. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Better than a chicken, chicken in, in every, every pot. pot. During the presidential campaign of 1928, a circular promoting Herbert Hoover said, if he'd won, there'd be a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. He won the election, but he never honored that campaign promise because, because the nation was hit with a stock market crash, which plunged it into the Great Depression. Yeah, 1929. You see, politicians make all sort of promises. Well, not only that, but the truth of the matter is, and we'll just throw everybody else in there, whoops. At the same time, it's like, you can't say tomorrow I, I will go to this city and do this and that because you don't know what tomorrow holds, you know? So I'm not through with politics. Okay, I'm sorry. Mark Twain said, if you'd like to know if <laughs> politicians lie, True. look and see if his lips are moving. <laughs> yeah, you gotta uh, love it. Uh, I do yeah, love it's it. just unfortunately too close well, to the truth. We want to tell you about somebody who never lies. Amen. Never has. That's who we're talking about tonight. Never will. He can't lie. So when God promises us a house and a yard, there you we go. take it to the bank. That's it. And by the way, God not only wants us to own a house, but houses. Think of the scriptures. Yeah. And, and see, some of this <laughs> okay. we can't see because of, of the perspective that we've had. Mm -hmm. we, we've never gotten the fullness of the scripture explained to us. And, and we don't recognize that. It's not our fault. Sometimes it's not a choice that we would consciously make. But it's kind of like F.F. Uh, F. Bosworth said, you can't have faith for what you don't have knowledge of. That's it. It's what we have to have knowledge of that we can do. And it's called reading the Bible. Do what it says. That's it. Seven words. Seven words. So in... There's actually several scriptures that deal with this. You want to go into every one of them? They're good, but Deuteronomy 6, like 11. <clears throat> oh, thank you. The classic Amplified said, and houses full of good things, this is what he's promised, which you did not fill, and hewn evacuated cisterns, wells, which you did not dig out, and vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant, and you eat and are full and are satisfied. Now, I know when somebody hears that, Maybe not here, but somebody around the world, they'll be saying, but Brother Harold, I lost my home due to foreclosure. I, I've been evicted from my house because I couldn't pay the rent. Here's the deal. Don't fret about the loss. Mm. Embrace the gain. Embrace your future. Embrace your future. And so for it in word and deed. Nehemiah 5.11 in the contemporary English version says, you must restore their fields, vineyards, and olive groves and houses to them this very day and repay the interest that you charge when you lend them money, grain, new you. wine, and olive oil. That's it. Nehemiah 9.25, contemporary English version. All right. They captured strong cities and rich farmland. They took furnished houses as well as cisterns, vineyards, olive orchards, and numerous fruit trees. Mm -hmm. They ate till they were satisfied, which is what I'm going to do on Thanksgiving. Uh, they <laughs> and be and be thankful. And be, I'm gonna definitely be thankful. We'll talk about that at the end of the at the end of the broadcast. They were all satisfied, and they celebrated their abundant blessings. Amen. And, and we're not going to go through all this. You got them on the outline. There's a couple of other scriptures. Well, this one's important in Matthew 19:29. Read, that one. Read that. Because this is not anyone and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or lands for my sake will receive many, even a hundredfold times more, and will inherit eternal life. 
Amen. So he's out for us. Seven, you know. your family. Yes. Romans 8, 16 through 17. And it says, this is in the Classic Amplified, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. And if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. You know, we may be joined here. I mean, we may not have all this right now, but the point of it is, is we're, we're believing, we're claiming the word. We may be going through stuff, but stuff ends and God, his word doesn't end. And the good news is we're a joint heir with Christ. That's right. Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now the Greek word for heirs is G28, 18. G28, 18. And it means one who receives by lot an heir, one who has acquired or obtained the portion allotted to him. Hallelujah. We're not to have an heir, we're to be an heir. That's it for God. Galatians 3.29, Classic Amplified. And if you belong to Christ, are in him who is Abraham's seed, then you are Abraham's offspring and spiritually heirs according to the promise. The Greek word for joint heirs means a fellow heir, one who obtains something assigned to himself with others, a joint participant. The term heir is most frequently used today and legal documents, That's right. last will and testaments. And since we're joint heirs with Christ, our right to an inheritance rises and falls with Jesus. That's it. The word joint literally means intertwined and made into one. Now we could go on, but the bottom line, if we're joint heirs with Christ to an inheritance, then what's his is ours. That's right. There's no inheritance until someone dies and Jesus died so that he could give us the inheritance that sin took away. Think of that. Hallelujah. In Hebrews 9, verse 15, in the classic Amplified, it says, Christ the Messiah is therefore the negotiator and mediator of an entirely new agreement, testament, or covenant, so that those who are called and offered it may receive the fulfillment of the promised everlasting inheritance. Since a death has taken place, which rescues and delivers and redeems them from the transgressions committed under the old or first test of first agreement. God Hallelujah. is constantly opening so much more than yes. what we, we have at the have. moment. That's right. He's mm -hmm. pouring out blessings on us in so many ways. I know. In so many ways. Not just financial, mm. but family. You know, Every way. Health. That's right. And <clears throat> claiming the promises. It says, Romans 4, 20 through 21. He did not waver at the promise. They were talking about Abraham. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. What God had promised him, he was able to perform. Abraham was not tempted to waver at the promise God made to him or anything else. Well, he may have been tempted to waver. But he didn't. But he remained faithful. Sometimes we are, sometimes it gets wavery out there. Let's face it. Well, it took him a while too but, to catch what God meant when he said, go out, count the stars. So the point being is that, you know, we may... We may, we may even stumble and fall down, but the point is we get up. We keep going. We dust ourselves off and we go, we know that our God is a faithful God, a faithful God to the end, and we remain faithful. And, and here's the thing to know. God wants more for us yes. than we even want for ourselves. I know. And his plans for us are bigger than ours. That's right. And he can see things that we can't, we can't see, see right at now. the moment. And you may not have what you're wanting. Matter of fact, you may be way behind, as the old saying goes, you might feel like you're behind the eight ball, you know, about to get knocked out of the picture. But many, 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 a character in the Bible you can read look like they were in that same position, but God, but God. And we have to be encouraged by the fact that he 
if he made the if he made the, the heavens and the earth with his mighty outstretched arm and he said nothing is impossible with him, then nothing is impossible with him. Here's what you have to do with the eight ball. Call the pocket and knock it in it. <laughs> <laughs> then you don't have to worry about it anymore. All right. That just came to me. I will. In a vision, I know. Here, here's the thing. Uh, God wants to do more for us. I'm restating this. Than we can imagine. Mm -hmm. And he'll reveal it to us. Yes. If we talk to him, we spend time with him. We put him first. Yeah. And, and there are people who are listening that say, Well, Brother Harold, I've done all that. I put him first. Doesn't seem anything's working out the way I want it to. Well, just because it hadn't been, that means it's not going to. That's it. And uh, keep doing what the Word of God says. I always feel like the harder it is, the tougher it is, the more demanding it is, the greater it will be. I always think of Joseph, you know me. And you, all of y'all know me too, because I talk about him all the time. But I just think when, you know, everything he went through, he had every reason in the entire world to just throw his hands in the air and go, this just isn't working. But he didn't. And he became second in command, literally, Pharaoh took a seat, and he really ran the land. So that yeah. was a lot to pay, but for a but a very big success. And yeah, it is me too. Amen. That's it. So trusting and believing God's part of the process. My mama told me from an early age that Thanksgiving's every day. Mm. It's every day. Not just the fourth Thursday of November. That's it. But every day. Um, I want to encourage you if you're traveling to visit with family, before you go, once you get there, sit down and say, let's all talk about how God's blessed us in the last year. Amen. We, uh, for years, we had a blessing box. I know. I should share that every it's, year, really. It's like a shoe box, <clears throat> hole cut out, paper put on it, blessing box. And any time any of our children or us had... Through the year. <clears throat> you start the day after Thanksgiving, through the year, and the Lord just comes through for you one way or another. You write it out and put it in the blessing box. That's it. And then on Thanksgiving Day, we take them all out. And read it. And remember all those... And hand them to everybody put it in. Many things and, uh, that God's done all God year read. long. You and then the, you don't have to... You, you know, read the most. And then you don't have... <laughs> then you don't have to remember it all year long, but you re start remembering it. You know, you just, just take a minute and write that out. And you just look back and realize how much and how many times God has just come through for you. I and mean, if you don't do every that, day. just write down. Start writing. Yeah. You know, uh, typing. Type it out. Until, until you... You know, don't don't say, well, I've got to have 140. No, I don't do that. Just write until you feel like that's good mm -hmm. and stop. But then start a blessing box. You I remember, never regret it. I remember one of the first times I ever did that. I was about to go on the air with a live stream TV show. And uh, the Lord said to me, why don't you write down all the ways I blessed you yesterday? And I started writing them out. And I'm looking at the clock and I'm going, you got to get ready. 72 things that He'd blessed me the day before. Amen. And uh, you may only have seven. The number's not as important as the attitude of thanksgiving That's right. for what He's doing in your life. And that doesn't even count the things that He did you didn't and, even and it see. it also doesn't count the fact that we're thankful for all of y'all. That's it. Here tonight.